Good to have you here this evening. Let's take our Bibles, if you would. And uh, we'll take and look at Psalm 112. In just a few seconds, we'll have a word of prayer. Brother Terry's passing out our outlines. I didn't get them passed out. I was walking around here shaking hands and talking. Forgot about passing them out. The character of the upright. Let me give one... Well, maybe a couple statements. Thomas Paine stated, character is much better kept than recovered. That's true. Character is so important. Now, I know we have some characters around here, but having character is another subject altogether. I was trying to think today, and I didn't get to dig, dig my book out. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. made a statement about character. But someone also made the statement, character is what you are behind closed doors. And that might have been Dr. Bob Jones Sr. I can't remember if that was he or not. But uh, that's true. Then uh, Freeman said, character is not made in crisis, it's only exhibited. And that's true as well. You know, your char true character comes out when the pressure is put on or circumstances get tight, uh, situations become uncomfortable, and uh, David talks about that tonight. We're going to see it in this chapter, Psalm 112, that gives us 10 verses that really talk about nine points of our character based upon God himself. As a Christian, we should be reflecting the very character of God. And I'll show you that in just a few seconds that so we'll jump back to the book of Matthew chapter 5 uh, to prove a point that really God wants, to, wants us to emulate in our lives on a daily basis. So tonight we're talking about character. The character of the upright. The person who's upright is a person who is always basing things upon the principles of God's Word because God's Word is always right. Would you concur with that? God's Word never is wrong. It's always right. No matter how we look at it, you know, we might think, well, we're, we're right on the base. No, God is the one that's right all the time. And so we need to uh, take and uh, let that be in our lives. Let's have a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. We pray as we open it up that first of all, we invite your Holy Spirit to teach us. Let us have your mind. Let us uh, receive the things that would enable us to be the Christian that would truly emulate the very character of God. And so I pray you would speak to us through your word as we open it up tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Many times we talk about the character of God, simply we're talking about His attributes. Now, we could talk about, uh, for example, God's love. That's an attribute or a characteristic of God. And every one of the characteristics of God have a, uh, a similar fashion, that is, or similar characteristic to go along with it, and that is they're eternal. There never will be a time when God does not love, okay? There'll never be a time when God's not kind. And we could go on down in the list. Now we see some of these characteristics also presented in the, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, which we call the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance. And uh, we could probably add a lot more to that, but those are some basic fruits of the Spirit found in the book of Galatians. And David wants us to see the character that really is uh, probably missing a lot of Christians today. This should be there. So what's the problem? The problem is we have not permitted his word to take control of our lives because everything about the character of God is based upon that which he said. Okay? Which is his word. So character... And it's sad because God wants that every Christian to truly emulate his character. Really the key verse of the chapter is found in verse number 4 if you look there. And then we'll uh, go on and uh, study the 10 verses. It says, Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Now he's talking about the upright. Now, it sounds a little bit like God there in those verses because he is completely righteous. There's none, nothing in him whatsoever is unrighteous. He is full of compassion. 
But he's actually talking about a person who is upright. Now we know God is upright. Upright means he will always do right. There never will be a time when God will do wrong. See? Now because of that, God wants you and I to emulate his very character. And so I'm going to show you here tonight some things that might really help us. David Burnham said this, Righteousness, doing what is consistent with God's character. Now let me make that statement again. Righteousness, which righteous means doing that which is right. Doing what is consistent. God never is inconsistent in regards to his very being. And never will be. See. If there ever would ever be a time, which there will not be, that God would not take and uh, do what's right or be righteous, he would be inconsistent with his very nature or attributes uh, that he uh, shows to mankind and, of course, wants for you and I to have in our life. So what are some of the characteristics that God shows us? Well, let's read verse 1 through 3 and then we'll get into the actual thoughts of his character. David starts out, says, Praise you the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth, in other words, as you and I, means reverence or give due respect. Uh, feareth the Lord that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the, say it with me, upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness, say it with me, endureth forever. Now there's nine characteristics that God gives us here in regards to the person who is upright. Nine characteristics, though we, there might be any more, but we could probably take any, everything else and we could take those nine categories that he gives and place them underneath there, okay? So what are some of these things? Well, number one, a person who is uh, emulating as an upright person the characteristics of God, he will strive to do these things. Number one, he is one who is an example and testimony among the dark world we live in. Look at verse number four. He says, Under the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. Now, I begin to look at that and let my heart begin to ramble. And some of these thoughts even came when I was given uh, Brother Sandy the study this morning. Or I should say this afternoon because uh, we got a little bit late start today. But I begin to think of, uh, about this matter of light. The very first thing that God created was what? Light. He said, let there be light. And there was light. Now that's important because of the progression of the thought that God talks about in, in regards to his very character. God had to create light because of who he was and is. In him is light, the Bible says, and there's no darkness at all. And I'll give you that verse when I come to another portion of, of the lesson. So that being true, God had to speak light into existence. There could not be darkness because of his very character. See? Then secondly, we find in 1 John chapter 5, that uh, God talks about that darkness being dispelled. And then further than that, he goes on to say in John chapter 8 verse 12, it says, Jesus began to speak and he says, I am the light of the world. Now watch this. He who follows me. All right? A person that's upright person who is uh, living according to righteous biblical principles it says he who follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life 
Now the progression goes on to show us the character of God through our lives in regards to what we're to emulate to the world. And that's found in the book of Matthew chapter 5. So if you turn over there and uh, keep your place in the book of Psalm, you're familiar with it. We did a study not too long ago when we started uh, the Beatitudes and we worked our way down through uh, the verses. And then we came down uh, to um, uh, verse number... Uh, what is it, 13? He says, he, matter of fact, he gave us two things to kind of show us character. He go, shows us salt here because salt produces purity. All right? And I believe it goes right along with the light because God's light is absolute pure light. Now, look around this room if you would, too. If you would. Yours, uh, uh, several years, well, not... When did you put these lights in, Terry? Uh, there was a big change in the auditorium when Brother Terry put these lights in. Of course, even this is not pure light. You want pure light, you go outside. Now, I've noticed something in here. I have to use my glasses in regards to reading uh, any, any writing. But if I go outside, I don't need my glasses because that light makes it better for me to read and I don't have to use these uh, since I have uh, 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 near silence or far silence, whatever which one it is that you can't, I can't, I can't read without my glasses. So light is very important in regards to us, now watch this knowing the direction we're going, seeing things in a clear way, the way God thinks, sees them matter of fact, let me give you this verse James 1 5 says if any man lacks what? Wisdom. Now, wisdom in that context means looking at things from God's perspective. God always looks with a pureness of light. Okay? So when we're looking through God's eyes, we will always see what? Right. Okay? He will always show us what is right. So wisdom is knowing what's right to do and doing it. See? Okay, so David wants to get across to us here tonight. The first characteristic that you and I ought to have is this matter of light. Now look here at uh, Matthew chapter 5 I had you turn to. He says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to cast out and be trodden underfoot of men. And then he gives us the next thing that we represent. First, it talks about the purity. Secondly, is the light. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. And of course, the verse that we quote so often, Let or permit your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works. And the end result is to glorify the Father in heaven. So the first characteristic that God desires in your life and my life as an upright person, and of course, if we're upright, we're doing that which is right, then it will show forth as a testimony to the Lord. God wants our lives to emulate His very character. What character do we emulate if we don't walk in the light as He is in the light? The old nature or that which is evil? See, that's the reason the Bible says, Thy word, quote it with me, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You see, if you and I are to walk in this world in the right way, here's the map. Here's the instructions. Here is what you and I need in order to do what's right and to be right with God and be right with other people. And if we're to emulate the character of God, we've got to daily get into the Word of God to let it permeate our lives, to purge us, to make us pure. And then the end result is our lights are going to be, you know, presented to the world. They're going to see true, the true character of God in your life and my life. After all, as Christians, we are to be what? Christ, Christ-like, see. And we can't do that without having the Word of God, you know, penetrate our lives to make us what we ought to be in this life. So, uh, that's so important. Now, look back there, if you would, to the book of uh, Psalm chapter number uh, 112. 
And look at the second thing that he gives us there in verse number 4. And you have your outline so you can see right, uh, right away what, uh, what you should be emulating as far as the character of God. And that is, we are one who shows favor and lends to others. God wants you, and I actually it goes into verse 5, and we'll jump back to verse 4 because uh, I messed up in my outline there. But it says, a good man showeth what? Favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. And we'll look at that in just a few seconds. But uh, one who shows favor and lends to other. Uh, Jesus commanded you and I in Scripture to lend expecting nothing in return. That means as followers, we don't expect anything back. We're to be giving. Now, does God give back to us? Yes. That's based upon Scripture. Here it is. Come on. Give, and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. When you and I realize the second characteristic is giving. God gave light, and then He gave. Now, I could, go, I could explode this thing in a tremendous way. I could go back and, what did He give us? Well, if you went back to Genesis, he gave us all the things he created on each individual day. Those weren't for him. He gave them for mankind to enjoy upon this earth. Now, we know that was messed up when Adam and Eve uh, shook off the Word of God and went in a different direction and became darkness rather than light. And they just messed up th everything for everybody. And, but we have a choice, don't we? And so you and I, if we catch the second thing is, when we start giving and showing favor towards other people, by the way, even towards the evildoers, we're emulating the very character of God. By the way, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, we don't get out underneath the microscope that we did wrong. So God says, if I'm a giver and I'm showing favor towards other people, what are you supposed to do as a Christian? Do the same thing. See? This is what David's trying to get across to here. He says, we need to learn to emulate the very character of God, not just in showing forth our light, but showing forth a good character of giving to other people and showing favor to other people that they can see truly that there's something different about us as Christians and that we want to have the life of Christ Shown forth. I mean, everything, didn't the Bible say that Jesus went about doing what? Good. All right? Now, in doing good, he took and even told people when they were wrong. Huh? Now, you know, a lot of times we don't want to offend people, but you can go about it in the right way. If somebody does something wrong, you need to tell them in a right way when they do something wrong. I actually didn't do this yesterday. It annoys me. Can I, can I get something off my shoulders tonight? It annoys me when people go in the bathroom and don't go out. Uh, when they come out, they don't wash their hands. Especially in a restaurant. Because then I don't want to touch a thing in that place. You know? And sometimes we don't speak up when we should about things. I don't want to handle stuff that somebody's handled. Okay? But that, that's just right. Sometimes we hold back because we don't think we're... Do, but we're doing good because we're protecting people. We're helping people. Okay? And I know that's just an example. I had, I had to, you know, get that out of my system on you tonight. <laughs> but... God wants us to do good. He wants us to show favor. He wants us to do that which is right. Now, jumping back, if you would there, into verse number four, you and I really take on one of the greatest characteristics in the whole Bible when you and I show compassion. Uh, compassion is simply love in action. Okay? Uh, we could use another word for that. That's charity that you find in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. See? Now, 
God showed his love in toward, uh, you know, towards mankind in the while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That's preeminent in the, the compassion that God showed towards mankind. Uh, and I think about this even in a stronger way when I think about, now you think about this. Don't ignore what I'm saying tonight. God, in the person of Jesus Christ, God being Christ, Christ was God. But he's the outward manifestation of the Godhead. Jesus went hunting, actually went and got Adam and Eve and showed them compassion. I mean, just think about it. He could have said, mankind, don't want to have anything to do with you. We wouldn't be here today. See? But God took care of that kind of situation even for the foundation of the earth when he, sent, when he had Jesus. He said Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Now I don't understand that whole concept because God knew everything was going on. Why did he let it happen? I know why he had let it happen. Because he did not create man as a robot. He created him as a free will individual. To choose. See? God made, made provisions on each side of the fence. I don't understand all the concept there. I don't think any man will ever understand that whole concept. But God is full of compassions, and His compassions, the Bible says, fail not. Somebody asked me one time, what does that mean? It means it don't fail. It never will fail. It doesn't, go, it doesn't go wrong. It's always right. It's always there for every person. Doesn't matter who they are. God is full of compassion. Uh, he can't differentiate in regards to the fact of saying, well, this person deserves my full compassion. Listen, none of us deserve the love of God. None of us deserve the compassion of God. But God does that because He knows that we need it. Let me park there just a minute, would you please? I think sometimes we look down on people that God doesn't love certain people. Now folks, I'm not for the homosexual agenda, and you know that. But I want to tell you something. God still loves the homosexual. Amen. God doesn't love their ways. They may have a bend towards that. Uh, let me ask you a question. If a person has a bend towards alcohol, and some people do. They have a chemical, their chemical makeup may have a bend towards that. All right? Does that mean that we push them away and we don't have compassion on them? No. Sin is sin. God still loves them, and God wants them to be restored to follow what He says in His Word. Is what they do wrong? Well, the Bible would never give us Romans chapter 1 or many other passages of Scripture showing God's condemnation upon that type of lifestyle. You see, man has to realize how much God loves him. When they really understand the compassion of God, how much he cares for them, then that will change their life. And God wants us to have the compassion the way we should upon people that we need to reach out to them to try to win them to Christ. Listen, let me tell you something. Yes, we're against that lifestyle, but we are to try to help them to come to know Christ. They're included in John 3, 16, folks. Just as much as the alcoholic, just as much as the dope addict, or any other type of sin that people commit. God still loves them and wants them to be saved. The Bible says he is full of compassion. And if God loves them, you and I are to love them once again, emphasizing not their lifestyle or their ways, but we love their souls for Christ's sake. Okay? Now, you and I need to do that. And so when Jesus saw the multitudes, the Bible says he looked upon them with compassion. Now let me stop right there. In that multitude, there were probably every type of person you could think of in that multitude. And the, he was moved with compassion because they were like sheep that have gone astray. And he wanted to restore them. 
how many people do you know tonight that are out here, even in New London, that have gone astray, and all it might take is you to go to that person and say, we love you. We'd like to see you back in church. Huh? We'd like to see you back following the Lord. We'd love to be able to see you. That may be something that God could speak to your heart about. You know, I may not be able to get them in, but you may be able to. You might be able to reach that person and get them back following the Lord and loving the Lord. You see, compassion is a virtue that Jesus constantly dis demonstrated here on the earth. Even the people he had to come down hard on, he still loved them. He had compassion on them because he knew their need in their life. And so you and I need to do that. Well, let's go to the next thought. Look at the second part of verse D. Uh, verse D there in verse 4. Excuse me. It says, He is gracious. Now, that matter of gracious means He's full of grace. Grace is something you and I don't deserve, folks. But God wants to give it to us. See? And it's extended because... Of the fact of what he was do, going to do upon the cross at that time. And of course that what he has already done in regards to our lives. And then he comes there, uh, verse number 4. He says in the lat latter part, he says not only full of compassion, but he's full of righteous. In other words, full of righteous acts. Acts of righteousness. Uh, turn over to the book of Matthew chapter 6, would you please? Matthew chapter 6. The Old Testament gives us the principle which fulfilled in the New Testament through acts that Jesus did and likewise the acts that you and I ought to perform in and through our lives. Matthew chapter 6. If you look at verse number 1 there. He says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Billy, I say unto you, they have the reward. Now, we've studied all these things here in regards to how we are to perform things outwardly before men, that they can see righteous acts. Not in a wrong way. Like, for example, he talks about here our giving. Uh, we give not because we want somebody to give us a pat on the back. We give because God tells us we ought to give. And we do it so we can advance the kingdom of God. Now, those acts could be just not financial acts. They could be other acts that we perform. Uh, for example, in the church. I mean, if you sing in the choir, are you doing a righteous act? Sure. If you teach a Sunday school class or if you do some other things, uh, you're doing righteous acts. God wants us to emulate him in our acts of performance because it's reaching people. It's doing something for people that they need in their lives. And of course, anything you do through the church uh, or uh, out in the community and, and serving the Lord, uh, you're doing righteous acts. And we've got to be careful that we don't get like the Jewish uh, uh, Sadducees and Pharisees. They did it for the, to be presented to men. Matter of fact, they would go out to give to the poor what they do. They blew the trumpets. Come on in here. We're going to give you some. We're going to give you some money. You know, we're going to. You know, pay you off. They thought that they would get a pat on the back. You know, from God from that. And he says, No, you're not to do that as a thing before mankind to get a pat on the back. That should even be done in private. And then your prayer. They sounded the trumpets when they would go out to pray. You know, look how, much, how long I pray, you know. And uh, Jesus said, that person didn't do me any good. But he said to the other man, the publican, he says, that man went down to his house justified. So he talks about our matter of giving, our matter of praying, 
And of course, a matter of fasting that he went on through that scripture. If you went on down through the, the verses there that we've already talked about uh, in, in our past study in the book of Matthew. Turn back to the book of um, uh, Psalm chapter 1, 12, if you would please. Look down to verse number 5. God sees all and knows all. And because you and I are made after the very image and likeness of God, God placed within you and I a will that he wants us to have discretion. So look there, if you would, at verse 5 again. A good man showeth favor and lendeth, but the latter part, he says, he will guide his affairs with discretion. All right, God was very uh, discreet in the things that he did because he wanted to do everything the Bible calls it all things are to be done what? Decently and in order. When God created each thing upon the face of the earth, God just didn't fling those things in. Everything was done with discretion. Why? For the provision of the animals, provision of mankind. Everything he did in creation was done with discretion. And you and I, as a Christian, in our lives, should not go helter-skelter in things. We should have things done decently and in order. That's the reason, uh, years ago, that a man, by the name, uh, and we have a set of rules that we use called Robert's Rules of Order. Okay? which gave um, those who were in meetings and so forth a plan whereby to go to do things in the right, proper way. See? And the same way, God wants order in our lives. You know? God wants us to have order. And one of those things that will help us have order is to use discretion in our choices of life. Now watch this. Based upon biblical principles. You're going to get sick hearing that statement, but it's true. See? We must do things God's way because of the very character a Christian ought to have. We ought to do it after what God says and not what the way we may think it. See, that's where wisdom comes in. Wisdom makes knowledge that we have functional. And when we have the wisdom of God, God enables you and I to have discretion in using the knowledge He has given us to do things in the right way. See, if you don't have things done the right way, guess what's going to happen? You have what we call chaos or confusion. See, and the Bible says God is not the author of, say it with me, confusion. See. And so in order for us to be able to do that, God, when He created us in His image and His likeness, He gave us the ability to have discretion in our life. We have the ability, once again based upon biblical principles, to look at something and say, this is wrong, this is right. And a Christian should always choose that which is right based upon the Bible because of righteousness. See? Righteousness is always doing that which is right. So God wants you and I have discretion in the affairs of the Christian life because when we don't, what happens? We violate the very character of God that we've been created with. See? Now let's go a little bit further here tonight. Look there, if you would, at verse number 6. He says, Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. What's he talking about there? He's talking about a Christian who is steadfast. Isn't it any wonder that when Paul said there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of what? Dan Moore? No. In the work of the Lord. Everything that functions in our life should be in the principle of the work of the Lord and not just our agenda. Now our agenda should line up or parallel with that which God lays down for our lives to do. And we will always be doing that which is right. Do you ever think about that? When you do things God's way, you will always do what is right. See? And so David here, he says, if you want to be a steadfast Christian, you must emulate the very character of God because God is, 
Now say this with me. He is unchangeable. He changes not. See? He's not going to change upon, change from, uh, from uh, right to wrong. He's always going to do that which is right. See? And you've heard me say that, make this statement a thousand times probably here. Do right though the stars fall. Right? No matter what's happened, no, no matter what's transpiring in your life, just do what's right. Choose that which is right in your life. You're going to never go wrong. Now, he goes on a little bit further. There's another characteristic found in verse number 7. He says, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. You and I, when we have the character of God, we're always going to have a fixed heart, even when evil tries to take and overtake your life and my life. We're going to do what's right. Evil cannot overtake your life if you are emulating the character of God. See? You don't have... Listen, you and I don't have to do wrong. We don't have to sin. Now, I'm not going to take time to go to the Scripture tonight, but go over to the book of 1 John, and the Bible says we don't have to sin. Why? Because of the very nature that we have in us called the Holy Spirit. Read there in 1 John chapter 5. God shows us we don't have to choose wrong, or we don't have to sin. See? Because we do not have to be overtaken by Sin. Now, look at verse 8, because he goes, he said, here, here's the problem. Here's the problem found in verse 7 and verse 8. It's the heart. Now, talk with me tonight. What is the heart in mankind? The real you. The real you or your will. Okay? If your will is lined up with God's will, guess what? It'll be steadfast and fixed. Remember this. The natural heart of mankind, the will of mankind, Jeremiah says, the heart is what? Deceitful and desperately wicked who can know it. Okay? It's deceitful. So, in order for our heart to be right, if we are emulating the character of God, our heart will not be able to overtake that which God has instigated into our lives through the precious Holy Spirit. Because if the Holy Spirit is in control, then we will always have a fixed heart, see. And we'll choose right, we'll do right. And the Bible tells us here, his heart is established, he shall not be afraid until he, see his, until he sees his desire upon his enemies. So you and I are to have a fixed heart even when the wrong comes along, we have the opportunity of saying, well, I'm not going to yield to that. Based upon Galatians 5, 16. If we walk, come on, if we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right, the lust of the flesh goes after that which is evil or that which is wrong or that which is sinful. See? So if our heart is fixed upon God and He's in control of our life, then we don't have to yield to sin. Why? Let's go to Romans chapter 6, if you would please, real quickly. Our time's getting away from us. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> when a person's saved, they have a master, and we are the servant. So, what are we to do? Well, Romans chapter 6, and we uh, can't come to these verses many, many times in, in regards to other subjects we talked about. But in verse number 11 says, Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead in sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he says, Let not sin. Okay, now if you go back to verse 11, the word Lord there, am I in the right verse? Uh, verse 11, yes. Uh, the word Lord there means master. Now, if you ever who's your master, you're a servant of, right or wrong. Right. Okay? 
So then he comes to verse number 12, and he makes this statement. He says, let not sin. Okay, so you and I have, we have the ability to allow sin to dominate us as our master, or we have the opportunity of letting the Lord dominate us as our master and Lord, and uh, we are his servant. So he says, let not sin therefore reign. That's important. Reign means to dominate your life and give you instructions on what to do because it's like a king ruling over you. Reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now here's the key. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now you can go ahead and read the rest of those verses down through there that, uh, that go along with the thought of in regards to God's uh, predominance over your life and ruling and having a fixed heart towards Him. And when we do, then we don't have to yield to sin. Now, quickly, look at verse 9 of Psalm chapter 112. And let me give you the last few points here before we close tonight. A person who has the characteristics of God is one who disperses his goods and is not self-centered. Look at verse 9. He hath dispersed, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever. Now notice he comes back to this word righteousness again because righteousness means doing that which is right. Brother Ed says, if you see your brother in need and shut up your bowels of compassion, how dwells what? The love of God in you. Love gives. Love does that which is right. Love disperses. See? In this case, he says he disperses uh, to the poor. And we don't become, see, when you and I become self-centered, we move away from that characteristic of God because God was not self-centered. He wanted to share everything with us. So, we got to get away from this. This belongs to me. Uh, it's like that baseball and uh, bat syndrome. Well, if you can't do it my way, I'm taking my bat and ball and I'm going home. Look at the last thing found in verse number 10. It is one who has good, uh, good testimony even among the wicked. You know, we're in this world, but we don't have to be of the world. We have to work with the, uh, with the unsaved, don't we? But that's where God wants us to be. God wants us to be there as a shining light to the unsaved world because they need to see a Christ-like character. They need to see God manifested through our lives. See? And he says, the wicked shall see it and be grieved. Uh, by the way, let me jump real quickly with a statement here. Uh, the word griever is the same as uh, be to made to shame. Uh, Remember the Bible says that you were to do uh, good. Uh, we heap coals of fire on our head. Now, don't dump a, bu a bucket of coal, hot coals on somebody's head. It means do so much good towards them that they'll be ashamed the way they treat you, and they'll be burned up with shame. See? And so David says here, Look, the wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. How do you get rid of an enemy? Make him a friend. Him a friend. Love him to death. Love him to death. Okay? okay, same principle. Okay? Coming back to the thought that God committed his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? God loved us so much that it pulled us to him. Okay? And that's what we're to do in our lives. We're to emulate the very character of God. And I just gave you nine things here. And probably if we dug deeper, we could probably find more things about God here in this chapter that we're to emulate in our lives. Why? Because the character of the upright is to be Christ-like, to be God-like in our lives. Because we're created in His image and His likeness. Let's have a word of prayer. 
We thank you for your word tonight, Lord. We pray that each one of us will let these thoughts permeate our lives, that when we walk out of this building tonight and through this week, that people will truly see a Christ-like character in and through our lives, in our words, our actions, and the things that we might uh, do towards them. And I pray that we might be able to see more people saved because they see Christ in us. After all, the old saying, Lord, the only Bible that somebody might read might be our life. So help us to be the Christian you'd have us to be, to be upright in our character. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have your prayer sheet there tonight, I want to get a prayer sheet.